Our speakers tonight had long, distinguished, and globe-spanning careers in the United States State Department. Many of you are familiar with Christopher Hill. Um, Julie and Christopher Hill, um, the Vail Symposium could have expect no better friends or supporters. They've been involved with us for a number of years. We did a program with Christopher Hill last August, and it was really our honor to bring him back again. He is, as a reminder, uh, was an ambassador to four countries, Macedonia, Poland, South Korea, and Iraq. He was the head of the US delegation to the six-party talks on the North Korea nuclear issue, the dean of the Corbell School of International Affairs. He is currently at Columbia University's School of International Studies and um, International Affairs. So we welcome both Ambassador Christopher Hill and we did a program a couple of years ago, some of you may have attended, Ambassador Hill was in conversation with another ambassador and it was really an excellent program. So we thought, let's try to find another ambassador and our folks at the World Affairs Council recommended Ambassador Gary Grappo. He was the envoy and head of mission of the Office of the Quartet Representative, the Honorable Tony Blair in Jerusalem. He also held senior positions at our embassies in Baghdad as well as in Riyadh, and he was our ambassador to Oman. He is currently a distinguished fellow at the Center for Middle East Studies at the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. We're so honored to have Ambassador Christopher Hill and Ambassador Gary Grappo join us this evening. Please help me welcome them. <laughs> All right, well, good evening. And let me say, what a pleasure to see a real audience here. I mean, I, I don't mean you weren't real on Zooms and stuff like that, but I mean, this is really the way it ought to be. And so, real honor. I know it's, uh, whew, it's been a long time, the US, and frankly, it's continuing in the world, so we all have to you know, continue to be safe. But uh, it's such a pleasure to, to see you all here and, uh, and to see that the uh, Vail Symposium, I mean, neither snow nor rain nor dark of night uh, nor a global pandemic keeps the Vail Symposium down. So I think uh, uh, we've been very, very impressed, Claire, with how uh, you and Chris and others have kept things going here because uh, the world never stopped, and we're gonna talk about some of those issues tonight. Uh, Gary, and, and Gary and I go back, we, uh, we're ser we served together in, in, in Iraq, and uh, we've uh, you know, both been you know, sort of grizzled veterans of the, of the Foreign Service, and we've both taught uh, uh, students here at Corbell, uh, and about, you know, if you wanna make a difference, you know, go out there and, uh, uh, find a career. There are no home runs in foreign policy. It's usually just a long slog, but I think, uh, you know, I think uh, the students have uh, increasingly understood that uh, issues, if they thought things were going to go away and never come back, well, there are a lot of problems that uh, continue out there, and they're not going to uh, find that as they enter careers that they're not, that there will be nothing to do. There will be plenty to do. So I thought we're, we're going to talk about a, a bunch of sort of hardy perennials out there. I mean, it would be a terrible night if you couldn't talk about North Korea. I mean, you just want to pick them up and hug them, you know. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Gary, who has just tremendous experience in the Middle East and in other places, will talk about Iran, I think. And, uh, and we got to talk about our old stomping grounds, uh, Iraq as well. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important to talk about, you know, where we're going, where the new administration is going with, with NATO allies. We have allies around the world, and I think uh, uh, this is an administration that's very dedicated to the proposition that w we need friends and allies out there. And so we'll probably talk about where we are there, and then we'll talk, I think, the big issue that for many people is so worrisome, whether left or right, I mean, it's been, it was certainly true in the Trump administration, it's true in the Biden administration, is the question of China, and whether China, and whether our relationship uh, with China. So, uh, uh, and of course, Vladimir Putin, 
you know, yeah, he's always good for some... Uh, Another huggable Yeah, thing. yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, I think, uh, Gary, what do you think? Should we get going? Uh, yeah, let's get going. I also want to just express uh, my thanks for being here and to all of you, certainly to all the sponsors and donors for this great event. Uh, I'm, a, like Chris, a strong believer in um, informing the American citizen. I think events like this go a long way toward doing that. So it's a, a real pleasure and honor to be up here and uh, take a stab at doing that on our behalf. So uh, with that, why don't we uh, dive into some of these great issues. Yeah. Well, um, where would you like to start? Should we start in the Middle East? Because, uh, you know, that's the, remember during the Obama administration, there's a lot of talk, we're going to pivot, we're going to get away from this thing, and we're going to do other things that are more important, more central to our, our interests over time. But there seems to be a sort of thing where you pull back from the Middle East. So I wonder if you could maybe talk about uh, another old uh, hardy perennial, but which is, I think, kind of back in uh, some vogue, and that is the, the uh, Arab-Israel issue. Sure. Well, you know... Uh, and tell us what a quartet is, too. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll cover that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I often describe um, the Middle East as America's Hotel California. <laughs> Uh, I tried to check out six times and <laughs> there I was with Chris in Baghdad and then when I thought I was done there I got sucked into Jerusalem and when I went to first call on Tony Blair it was just before the UN General Assembly and he said you just got out of Baghdad right <laughs> yes I did he said and you're going to take on the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, but um, this is probably not an area of the, uh, uh, of the world where the United States can walk away from, uh, despite um, a lot of public sentiment that it's probably about time that we do. Uh, we have too many interests, too many friends, and too many alliances. Uh, and so, uh, for better or worse, um, we're going to be there. Not in the same way we have been in the past. Uh, at some point, I think, and. Chris would probably uh, uh, agree with this. Uh, we moved away from the focus on addressing the region's many, many problems using diplomacy, occasionally with a military force, but diplomacy to uh, an overemphasis on the use of our armed forces. And ultimately, uh, at least in my own view, it has created this um, sense of the militarization of US foreign policy. And um, so much of the attention in Washington is given to uh, the armed forces and their ability to affect change or not, um, and less and less toward diplomacy. And it's diplomacy uh, that really can, can, is, is the only solution to the, man, the manifold problems of the Middle East today. And the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, is probably the most indicative of that uh, I, I know that this administration would like to uh, diminish uh, the focus on the Israeli-Palestinian problem simply because uh, the conditions are nowhere near what they would need to be on either side in order, for get, uh, in order to get the two sides into a room and discuss constructively what needs to be done. Well, let me ask, I mean, the Trump administration took an approach that said, okay, these, this does look like an intractable issue, but let's, let's try to establish diplomatic relations among Arab states with Israel, and could this calm the situation down, and could it lead to eventual solutions? So they, they, they were not successful with some of the central players in the Middle East, but they were successful with Sudan, uh, they were successful with Morocco. They were successful in the United Arab Emirates. So I guess the question I, I would ask you as someone who has followed these things, uh, is, this, is this something worth pursuing from the Biden administration? That is, look at diplomatic relations, try to get the Saudis into this, try to get others, more central players into it, and somehow this will lead to some uh, you know, lessening of tensions toward a solution or something. Uh, the short answer is yes. There, and the United States has always wanted to see uh, normalization of Arab-Israeli ties. We really haven't given its due, 
And I think when the Trump administration saw uh, that it, it simply couldn't get out of the dugout, much less to first base on bringing uh, any kind of a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, uh, they started pushing on what now has become an open door. Uh, Arab governments are no longer going to hold their foreign policies, their economic interests, ho uh, hostage to Palestinian interests, and they're moving ahead. We saw that with the four countries uh, who have now normalized ties. I, I, um, I have some reservations about Morocco and the trade-off that was involved there. We basically gave away uh, Western Sahara uh, in, in, uh, in contradiction to standing U.S. policy. And U.N. policy. And I mean, UN every policy. country in the world was saying the Western Sahara should await an overall uh, exactly. And we solution. sold out um, the 700,000 people of the Western Sahara. And similarly, in the case of uh, Sudan, you have a transitional government in place right now. They just dispo uh, 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 deposed um, uh, this dictator who, is, who was convicted in the uh, International Criminal Court in The Hague for multiple human rights violations. Uh, they have a transition government to get them to elections. Uh, and so it's, and it's, they formed a united front among the various civil society organizations and so forth to hold these elections and ensure that they're democratic. And we forced them prematurely to making a very, very difficult foreign policy de decision by withholding money that they needed once they basically uh, acknowledged their responsibility for multiple terrorist attacks yeah. in the past. Yeah. And, but nevertheless, none of these countries have ever been at war with Israel. It's important to point out. It's not a peace treaty. It's normalization, diplomatic ties. Uh, and I think the Biden administration is going to move forward uh, aggressively as well. There are another, a few other potential candidates out there. And I mean, as someone who's really dealt with this uh, you know, day by day, we have Bibi Netanyahu probably not coming back, although I don't know that. but. So how does that, how does the switch from Netanyahu to Bennett affect Israel's willingness to work these issues? Most definitely, the Israeli government is going to have a better relationship and a less polarizing relationship with uh, the U.S. government writ large. I think the, uh, the uh, Israeli government knows that it needs to repair its relationship with the Democratic Party, which historically has been of the stronger supporter, uh, supporter of uh, Israeli interests. So uh, they'll be working. So Bennett will pay more attention than to Definitely pay um, more uh, attention and will probably uh, put a lot less pressure on this administration when it comes to things like settlements, potential annexation, although I think that was pretty yeah. much um, uh, off, the, um, off, the, the, uh, off the possibility. So I don't think um, we're going to see a lot of uh, movement. It's more or less repair work and looking at some of the internal work that needs to be done both within Israel and within uh, 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 Palestinian territories. I will finally add that uh, what sort of threw the administration off was once again, and depending on how you count, it would be either the sixth or the ninth eruption of a war between Gaza and Israel. And uh, sadly, it's probably not the last. Uh, the Hamas has proven itself extremely resilient and resourceful and will probably be able to acquire the wherewithal to arm itself and again challenge uh, Israel. But for the time being, um, it sort of threw the administration off track when it came to uh, the Israelis and the, and the Palestinians and it forced the administration to do something uh, that probably wasn't ready to do but had to do and that is reach out to countries uh, where we have a bit of a sensitive relationship like Egypt and Qatar to help uh, put that, uh, the, the Hamas violence back into the box. And, but this is only temporarily, yeah. uh, only temporarily. Yeah. You know, uh, we could go on because there's the question of the whole approach of a, of a two-state solution supported by many presidents, not supported by the last president. Biden has indicated he wants to get back to the two-state two solution, but I think, as you mentioned, you need someone to negotiate with, and we don't seem to have that uh, right now. 
If I were the administration right now and looking at various negotiations, I would like to uh, plunge into with the idea of that they're going to take time and they're going to take uh, uh, real effort, and that is the issue with Iran, which is you know on another side of the uh, of the Middle East. And by the way, the third issue I think we ought to talk about in the Middle East is it, it's the South Asia really is the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. So um, I know that the administration is looking at the Iran issue with a view to seeing if we can get back to the, uh, to the joint uh, uh, plan of action, the JCPOA. Uh, and uh, the question is, right now it's been difficult and they're trying to do it very slowly, but the expectation was that the US, that this administration would understand that the reason JCPOA, one of the reasons JCPOA didn't really work in the, uh, during the Obama administration was the fact that we have seen misbehavior, if you will, from the Iranians all over the Middle East, all over Sunni areas in the Middle East, and uh, real, very aggressive in, in Syria, uh, very overt uh, intervention. In Iraq, we see uh, the Shia uh, uh, militia groups, often supported by Iran, and that support has never decreased, uh, despite the decision to uh, take Qasem Soleimani off the board, uh, uh, President Trump's decision to uh, have him essentially assassinated. But um, they have the, um, you know, the Quds Force, the Iranian uh, uh, Islamic uh, militias have been quite willing to continue to, to back these uh, Iraqi Shia groups. So we're not seeing any, anything there. Originally the problem was other signatories of the JCPOA, the French, the Brits, etc., said we cannot get into this regional stuff. We'd have to bring the Saudis in. We'd have to bring a lot of players in. And before you know it, we wouldn't really make the progress on the nuclear talks. I think the Biden administration goes in with a view that may be true, but this time we better address uh, some, of these, uh, some of these issues, uh, Iranian mischief. Uh, and um, we do so at a time when the Iranian government is even more uh, Islamicized than the previous government. Now, there's this old issue of, you know, who can go to China, and usually, you, you know, it's the, well, the answer is Richard Nixon. Well, they don't have Richard Nixon, but they have some equivalents there. And so there is an argument that maybe they're the right people to deal with, but I don't see it happening. And I think, like a lot of great ideas, we may be back to seeing if we can put that nuclear genie back in the, uh, back in the bottle. Uh, this is going to be... Uh uh, far more difficult than I think the administration uh, had anticipated uh, because of the results of the most recent election in which uh, a very conservative cleric uh, was elected as a new president and he'll take, he takes office uh, next month. Uh, now it's pretty easy uh, to win an election when all your more competitive opponents are screened out and not in, in, in whose names are prohibited from showing up on the ballot. You say they've had some voter suppression in Iran lately, <laughs> or some, something like that, yeah. Uh, and candidate suppression, <laughs> yeah. uh, basically. Yeah. Um, anyone who looked like uh, they might legitimately contest the election against, uh, we're talking about uh, Ibrahim Raisi, uh, who's held just about every position you can hold in the Iranian go uh, government, starting from the, the judge and executioner of Iranians after the Iran-Iraq War in 1988. Uh, Iranians claim that he has thousands of lives for which he's unresponsible. Um, uh, summary executions. So um, he's held at every job. He's rumored to be uh, the top candidate for uh, supreme leader when the current one, Ali Khamenei, uh, leaves the scene. Uh, we don't know, of course, when that's gonna happen, but um, so he had real, no real competition. Well, what is worth noting is uh, the election turnout was the worst they've seen uh, since the 79 revolution. And when you take out uh, the, ba the ballots that were invalidated uh, because they voted for no one, 
Uh, people were afraid that if they did not go to the polling places, they'd be penalized in their jobs or in their ability to get subsidies and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, and so they handed in um, uh, blank ballots, which are invalidated. And so it turns out they probably had less than a 40% turnout, which is the worst they've ever had. In the elections that, uh, for Rouhani, they had 70% turnout. So Iranians had already expressed their point of view before the election was ever held, yeah. and they're not pleased with the result. Yeah. And this is going to complicate the, election, uh, the, uh, the negotiation for Mr. Biden and his team. Um, in, in some ways, the Iranians need this far more. In fact, there's no question. They need this agreement far more. The sanctions have been far more punishing than anyone had ever anticipated because the United States invoked secondary sanctions, basically per permit, uh, uh, prohibiting anybody from doing any business with Iran uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the penalty of being shut out from the U.S. financial system, which no mid-sized business or bank or higher can afford to do. And so uh, they need this. But I think uh, Mr. Biden has a taller task here because he not only has to sell a persuasive deal to our P5 plus one negotiating allies, that's France, Britain, Germany, China, and Russia, and the EU, um, uh, that's number one. Number two is our regional allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel in particular, who have uh, um, uh, a real dog in this fight. They're very much concerned about the uh, malign influence or the militia activity throughout the region, ballistic missiles that Iran keeps testing and firing. Um, so they are very much interested in the outcome of this. And then ultimately, if this administration is to avoid uh, the trap that the Obama administration uh, fell into uh, and have this agreement outlast Mr. Biden's administration, be it one or uh, two terms, uh, it's, he's going to have to convince the US Congress and ultimately the American people. Yeah, I think the Iranians um, prior to, um, well, prior to our election, uh, were interested in the following. They were prepared to, to uh, take their, the pledges of no nukes and put it into law, put it into, into the, um, you know, the parliament and, and put those pledges into law. That doesn't help a lot, but it's at least something. They were prepared to take some of the expiration dates and push them out and make them um, for, forever. They were not prepared, however, to meet the U.S. side because they said we had a deal, the U.S. agreed to it, we agreed to it, and we're not going to meet and then renegotiate the deal. So it would have been a kind of complex uh, issue where they do some unilateral things while we do some unilateral things and avoid any perception that these things happen through a, uh, a subsequent negotiation. This all seems kind of juvenile. I mean, can, you know, if you're willing to do that, why don't you do it? Can't you, you know, why do you worry so much whether meeting? But I think it speaks to the fact that even Bruce brutal Islamic uh, um, governments also have their politics. And I think the, the view among, you know, a large portion of Iranians, a very, uh, very, uh, um, you know, hard line is they shouldn't be talking to a country that did not fulfill or did not continue to fulfill its uh, objectives. That said, and, and I, I got this because I, I was in New York, uh, and this was, you know, time flies when you're having a pandemic, but I think this was uh, back in 2019. And uh, I met with Javed Zarif, and he told me he was prepared to do it. The French had a concept that they would take what the Iranians were prepared to do and kind of hold it in escrow as the U.S. would prepare to do something. And then by, in effect, holding it in, in holding the payment, if you will, in escrow, they could then say, okay, the two sides are going to do this. We're not there yet. We're clearly not there yet. And I'm not sure where Javed Zarif is right now because I'm not sure he's in like Flint with this new, uh, this new crowd. So um, I think it's going to take a big effort 
to get through this. And I think meanwhile, the Biden administration is looking at an enormous issue in the Middle East, and that is the decision, which I, I for now has bipartisan support in this country, to pull our troops out of Afghanistan. And I think that is going to be, uh, as we see more and more signs of the Taliban taking over whole swaths of territory without even a fight, uh, and there will be a question. I mean, my sense is that Kabul will hold and a few other large urban areas will hold, but we don't know for how long. And I think any president presiding over a time when people are uh, you know, leaving on helicopters from the roof of the embassy, many of us remember those days, I think it's going to be very difficult for this administration to stand by and have this happen, despite the, the high polling numbers that suggest that Americans of all parties really think 20 years Chris, is enough. Um, if the administration were to reflect and, and, and think, okay, we're almost at some point where we'd be more, more comfortable to withdraw, yeah. what would that be? Yeah, exactly. And one would have hoped that the Afghan forces to which we have contributed billions and maybe a trillion at this point uh, would have stood and fought. And that's a brutal judgment because they simply don't see our support uh, so I know there are negotiations. I suspect, uh, you know, the Taliban, as you know, we've I used to see in the Balkans a lot. They are not a well-oiled uh, machine where they work together. They have all kinds of different groups, and I think they can get a locus of opinion from the Taliban that would not try to bring the situation back to where we began in the 1990s. Nonetheless, I think there's going to, you know, I think revenge is probably the most, uh, uh, the biggest motivator for some of these conflicts, and I think it's going to be really tough in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, three groups I, th I think are, uh, we have to be concerned about are certainly women and girls, uh, uh, and journalists and civil society yeah. will come under, uh, they've already faced uh, 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 killings, kidnappings and so forth. Um, and then um, refugees. Uh, when uh, the war erupted, when we in, uh, invaded in 2001, we began to see refugees move out of Afghanistan. And if it appears as though the, the Taliban is hell-bent on uh, uh, reinstituting the kind of government that they had had uh, when we invaded in the early 2000s, I think we'll see even greater uh, exodus of refugees, and this has got to be on the minds of the countries of the region, uh, who so far had stood on the sidelines, with the exception of Pakistan, which has aided and abetted actively and almost openly yeah. uh, the uh, Taliban. So we'll need to watch that. That'll be probably the first indicator without any troop movement yeah. going into um, uh, going into Kabul. I would mention even a fourth group, a subset of the refugees, and that is over the years, thousands of Afghans have worked with us. Yeah. And we certainly saw this in, in Iraq as we were ramping down the number of troops. When we were there, in fact, we went from 144,000 to about 50,000, and then a year and a half later to zero. And so the concern you have are people who've actually worked for you, whether as drivers, interpreters, whatever. This is real human stuff, because you know these people. And you know they have families, and they're, uh, they have extended families, and it behooves you to do something about it. It was a problem for us in Vietnam, uh, a huge problem, because those pictures of people getting on uh, helicopters, often they did not include the Vietnamese. So we, and we saw it in Iraq, and we're seeing it, and we're going to see more of it in, in Afghanistan. Yes, and this speaks to the fact that when you get into these things, it's a lot easier to get into these things and to get out of these things. And uh, so the problem of um, getting in with a kind of uh, unclear idea of when you can get out and get out in circumstances that not only have honor but also have some modicum of uh, success, 
uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult. I think President Biden is pretty much committed to this. He has seen it firsthand. I mean, he used to come to see us in, in Iraq a lot. He, he would go on for a visit to Afghanistan. He knows precisely that despite billions of dollars, it was not taking, it was not uh, uh, working in, in Afghanistan. And he fought that fight. I remember he used to tell us about it because he'd come out of meetings in Washington and he would be arguing with the, the generals uh, who would say, we need more time, we just need a little more time. And he said, you know, it's not going to work. That was in 2010. That was in 2010, yeah. And so I think he's, he's made a decision, no, I'm not going to throw uh, good after bad and we're going to do something about this. But it's not going to be pleasant as these months uh, peel by. I think in the end he, he, he made a, a very, very difficult uh, decision. I don't know any person who would not be conflicted yeah. now with what we face there. But that uh, what more could the United States do in the next year or two years or in five years that we have not done in the last 20 years. Yeah. And we had just reached that point, uh, just like Alexander the Great, the British, and the Russians. Uh, and, and, we, and we're leaving. Uh, but Chris, uh, we, we touched on the nuclear issue yeah. on Iran. Uh, let's move over to uh, your favorite person in the whole wide world. Uh, who is now down from uh, a hefty 300 to 240 pounds, really looking trim. Actually, he was 340, and he's down to 300. Oh, really? Yeah. That's all. <laughs> he's got a ways to go. He's, I, he's still in the super heavyweight class. <laughs> yes, yeah. Kim Jong-un is a, uh, you know, when he came up, I remember a lot of, first of all, uh, his father, uh, Kim Jong-il, who had been groomed for leadership in turn by his father, Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung used to take Kim Jong-il around and, and people kind of got the impression that this very uh, not ready for prime time player was going to take over and people kind of knew it. But when um, Kim Jong-il um, became Kim Jong very ill at a certain point and uh, <laughs> uh, I mean it was, we, we knew, we were talking and this was the summer of 08 and uh, we started, we, we realized we weren't getting answers and we knew that something had happened and then the rumors of a very serious uh, stroke. And, you know, uh, our, our docs in the CIA and elsewhere, you know, it's hard to look at a person on television and kind of do an accurate, uh, um, you know, diagnosis. But they were saying this isn't going to go on for long. They, they, were, they were pretty confident that he was in some trouble. She still didn't bring Kim Jong-un out and sort of show that he had a succession. So along comes this uh, Kim Jong-un who, uh, um, at first, you know, uh, there was, first of all, the, the thought that, well, maybe he's a reformer because after all, he's gone to school in Switzerland. And, um, but he was a day student. They'd drop him off and, <laughs> and uh, pick him up at night. So, you know, who knows? Uh, and, uh, but there was a lot of talk about whether he was a, uh, he was going to be a reformer or not. I talked to a Korean friend of mine in his late, now he's in his late 80s, he was in his late 70s at the time, and I, I uh, said, uh, song, his name was uh, um, Mike, uh, Mike Son, and I said, what do you think? <laughs> he takes a paper out, he points at the face of Kim Jong-un, and he says, just tell me, do you think this looks like a reformer to you? <laughs> and. Uh, and he was right, because the first thing we saw were a round of, uh, round of uh, executions, uh, very brutal. I mean, really even brutal for North Korean terms. I mean, this was happening pretty early on. He would, people would be summoned to these executions. The victims were, you know, killed with an anti-aircraft round through their chest, and there wasn't much left of them. I mean, this was a brutal guy. Um, and then we could see that the economy was going badly. And uh, that's when he started to say things that some people interpreted as meaning reform. That is, uh, we should not ask our people to tighten their belts anymore. Uh, he certainly wasn't at the time. Uh, and, uh, and so, I'm sorry, all those awful jokes, but I mean, he's just a terrible person. I, I can't resist. Uh, so <laughs> It's okay. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, 
So uh, there was a thought, well, maybe, maybe something could be done. Maybe there could be some approach. The Obama administration, very wary, weary, frankly, of doing that, found that when they tried something, it just didn't work. Even low stakes, it didn't work. So basically, not a lot was done during the Obama administration. Then the Trump administration came in, and I think too often they took the view, whatever our predecessors did, we'll do the opposite. So rather than be very standoffish and try to you know, work with the South Koreans and work with the Chinese on North Korea, and I'll get to China on that because that's a key element of the equation here, uh, they, the President Trump decided, you know, I will do it all, I'll do it by myself. And he goes to Singapore. It's a summit that was poorly, poorly prepared. And you know, when, you, when two presidents, you know, any politician at that level, you don't have to be a North Korean or you don't have to be an American, but any president at, anyone at that level skates on a very thin fact base. And so you better have things kind of tied down in various agreements that they've been over and they know what's going to happen. They had this meeting in Singapore, nothing really happened. There was some indication the North Koreans were per pursuing it, but as someone had listened to them before, I knew this, we were nowhere on this. Later on, they went to Hanoi, uh, and there was some hope in Hanoi because the North Koreans said, we'll get rid of our main nuclear reactor at Yongbyon. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, as a, as a negotiator, I hate to criticize people from 10,000 miles away. I don't know the details, but all I know is we rejected it and left within a few hours. I mean, I would have gotten, I would have said, you wanna, you're getting rid of all of Yongbyon. Uh, and I, I would have said, okay, let's unfurl a, uh, you know, uh, big map of Young Beyond and tell us what you're doing with building one and tell us what you're doing with building two and because there are about 98 buildings on them. And I would have tried to get some sense of, you know, well, we're putting, we're getting rid of that one. We're going to keep that because that's where we do, I don't know, uh, you know, we have cows and milk or something there. And, you know, I, what I just get some intel out of this. And I think one of the big problems with the Trump administration is when you don't know details, you often don't know the things you really want. They're not necessarily the things you're asking for publicly, but we needed people on the ground to understand these things. Never got anywhere. So uh, to make a long story short, in comes the Biden administration. And meanwhile, North Korea clearly has intercontinental ballistic missiles. They are way ahead of the Iranians. I mean, the Iranians are nowhere close to the North Koreans. And that's one thing people need to understand. Iran, Iran is not develop nuclear weapons. They've certainly never tested them. They've never come close to try to miniaturize uh, uh, designs to put them on a missile. They, they're, they're just nowhere close to the North Koreans. The North Koreans have done all of this stuff. So I think the, the Biden administration looked at it and basically had a kind of, uh, let's tread water on this for a while and let's try to see what we can do on Iran, which I think it will be the effort on denuclearization. Iran is not nearly as far, and maybe they could patch up JCPOA. I mean, Tom Cotton and Lindsey Graham will never be happy, but uh, uh, maybe they can do, maybe they can get something done, and then if there's any momentum from that, they can turn back to the North Korean question. I think the problem with the North Korean question as pursued by uh, the Trump administration was unilateralism. It was all about us. And so half the world says, well, the US isn't really doing enough, when frankly, I think the Chinese had to be at the table, the South Koreans, the Japanese, et cetera, even the Russians. And so uh, I would hope that with respect to this icy relationship we have with China right now, and an icy relationship that I uh, must say is very much part of what China's been doing, and uh, we can talk a lot about what China's been doing, but they are, there's a sea change in the way people view China in the region. Um, and so I think if we can at least try to find uh, some patterns of cooperation, try to find some areas rather than stare at the Chinese like we're having you know, some kind of uh, unsuccessful marriage counseling, but rather you know, look at some 
aspects of things that we can work with them on. I mean, after all, the Chinese are one of the five nuclear states in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They have no interest in North Korea having nuclear uh, capabilities. So I think at least we should start talking with them and having a serious and continuing, because I think the, uh, the Trump administration did some of it and the Biden administration is continuing to do it with the South Koreans. And I, I think there could be some so Chris, way what, forward. Uh, we've seen a real change in the way the Chinese look at not only themselves, but their role in the world. They've become far more assertive, even aggressively. Yeah. So over the last, um, five, six years. What accounts for this change? And, and what is it the Chinese are after? Yeah, I think um, what accounts for it is, uh, I think they're, uh, the fact that their political system is failing. Uh, their economy is not failing. And anyone who counts out China economically, I mean, these are people who know how to make stuff. and. Uh, uh, I think they're doing fine, but I think to a great extent they've done it in spite of their political system. So they make a virtue of their political system and try to claim that this political system, which is deeply flawed, is somehow part and parcel of why they've had a successful economy. So they start selling a model, and the model is based on the idea that authoritarianism works, and, uh, and this is why they have a successful economy. We have, I think, spent too much time telling the world why the Chinese model is wrong, and by the way, it is wrong, and not enough time fixing our model to suggest that our model is a better model. There is nothing more powerful than the powerful, than, a, than the example that you can, uh, that you can propose. So instead, we have, uh, I think, too often talked about you know, all, the f all the failures they have, and needless to say, the Chinese have kind of reacted poorly to that. Uh, that said, I must say, uh, China has uh, uh, not only touted what to me is a deeply flawed model, but they've also, I think, been rather rough on some of their neighbors. Uh, when I, on my watch, uh, the Vietnamese were very unhappy with the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese used to tell American f firms, you want to work on oil, our oil section, or sector or the Vietnamese oil sector, and if you're going to work with the Vietnamese, we don't want you, we'll get someone else to work with us. And those are pretty tough words, and the Vietnamese complained to me personally about it. And I said to the Vietnamese, oh, you know, I mean, outrageous, I mean, et cetera. I, I had a lot of sympathy, but how can we help? How, and they said, you know, you really can't. We, uh, we know you can't really help, but we want you to be aware of this. So it was kind of a, it's we're a telling. century old tent. Yeah, uh, yeah, centuries, yeah. So they're, they're basically saying, look, Americans, we, we just want you to know and, you know, stay close, but we're not asking. If you go see a Vietnamese today, I mean, they have their arms wrapped around your, uh, your pant leg as you're trying to get out of the office now. I mean, they have really a great concern about Chinese behavior. And uh, I think the Chinese need to look in the mirror and decide whether this is the relationship they want. Uh, to be sure, uh, one should respect history, and the history of Chinese neighbors is a history of tributary states. And I don't think they're quite willing to accept those states as sovereign equals. I mean, even in Europe, which has had a lot more uh, experience with sovereign equal, equals, they've had a tough time too. I mean, you should see what the, you know, I used to talk to the Poles about when they first come to the, uh, the uh, European Union, you know, everyone's the same, and they would escort the Poles down to the, you know, left of the salt and pepper shakers, and the Poles said, well, wait a minute, we want to sit in the middle of the table. And, and so there's pecking orders everywhere. But I'm saying I think it's very serious in, in, in China. How we handle this, we need to be calm, and calmness is a good idea. Uh, we need to listen as much as we're talking, and certainly avoid the shouting. Uh, but we also need to work on our, on our example because I think that will help, help where we are. And I might add, by the way, even despite our problems, China is not making any new friends in the world. So they're actually probably losing more friends these days yeah. because of this new new policy. And and to the point about 
um, the, the, the political challenges that they face internally. Uh, it, Hong Kong is a really good example of, I think, the fundamental nature of human beings who um, will do everything they can, despite whatever constraints, to exercise maximum individual freedom. And the people of Hong Kong did that to the extent that they could uh, before, uh, basically, the, the Chinese government came down on them with both yeah. feet. Yeah. Uh, and it's a good end, and, and the fear was that uh, if this movement within Hong Kong would begin to snowball, they might be seeing it elsewhere in China, and then they've got real problems. I think where we need to be calm, I mean, where we need to be careful is in Taiwan, Taiwan. because the situation there, we have had a policy going back to a kissing to Henry Kissinger and to a Kissinger and phrase, which was creative ambiguity. No one really knew what we would do if the Chinese pushed on, uh, on Taiwan. And there is a view, and you hear it a lot in, in recent years, that creative ambiguity has deteriorated and that the Chinese have reason to believe that we would not come to the uh, rescue of Taiwan. Um, and so the antidote to this was let's increase the notion that maybe we would. The trouble with that, and it's, I, I understand it, you're trying to reestablish this ambiguity. So right now people think, ah, eh, no, they're not going to ever help. So therefore we have to suggest that maybe we would, and then you get back to equilibrium on this ambiguity. The problem is you have, when you look at issues like that, you have to ask yourself, who controls the escalation? Uh, who, you know, if, if they do this, we do that, they do that, we do this again, do we do something else? And so you have to, uh, I mean, not to uh, trivialize it with chess or something, you better know what comes at the end of this. And if you don't feel that you have the uh, control, the escalation, that ultimately the other side will say, well, ultimately they'll do this and we don't want to get involved in that, therefore we're going to stop. Uh, that is the issue, and, and I think we've got to be real careful. And I am not satisfied that we have enough of an understanding of how the Chinese leadership, I'm not just talking about Xi Jinping, but there's a whole leadership there. They've abandoned a whole succession system, and you have to ask yourself why, because the succession system was kind of working out. So why did they do that? And so you have to worry how, as a polity, how as a, as a regime, would they react to being pushed a little on Taiwan? We're already seeing rather vicious-looking overflights by, uh, by strike aircraft in, uh, in Taiwan. And uh, we're seeing uh, an extraordinary capacity to build up a military which seems to go beyond China's needs in, in its littoral. So uh, I think China is a very serious problem, but we really need to think it through and think through how we're gonna work with them and what's the role of military cooperation, what's the role of, uh, of economic uh, um, support, because the Trump administration essentially ignored international th things like the World Trade Organization and various uh, re remedies you could use for, you know, when one country dumps products on another country. So we need to kind of leverage our position uh, and look at international organizations, look at good allies, and look at other th ways that China will understand that if they try to control the escalation, they will do so in a way that makes them isolated. I think, however, and I'll, I'll stop because I know I've been riffing on too much about China, but uh, the Trump administration started this uh, actually, it was started during the Obama administration. The Trump administration picked it up. The uh, Biden administration continues it. And that is that those of us who went to elementary school and had to learn what, what are the world's oceans, we'd see, well, there's an Indian Ocean, there's a Pacific Ocean, they seem to be separate oceans, there's an Atlantic. Well, now we talk about the Indo-Pacific. And what are we doing with that? Uh, are we changing our elementary school geography class? Or are we doing something else? Are we saying that somehow 
against a thousand years of history, we can bring India into the equation in Pacific and that somehow this will create an encircling feeling that the Chinese might have. And they might think, gosh, you know, if India's there, they're big, and then you've got the US and Japan, and we better start behaving ourselves a little better. You know, I understand it, but that's usually not how countries react to encirclement. And, uh, and uh, if you go back to the, um, to the Shanghai Accords, I think one of the great events. Why is it one of the great events? Because it essentially ended the Soviet Union. You, 1972 was when Soviet foreign policy essentially collapsed. And what had happened was the Soviets playing games with the Vietnamese, playing games with the Indians, playing games all over, trying to create a kind of encirclement of China. And what did China do? They reached out to us. And uh, the world's never been the same. We need to understand these things. We need to take time, think them through, and understand that uh, China is going to be around for a long time. I think we are too. And I, I am not one of these declinists. I think our country, I mean, you tell me someone's going to replace us, tell me, by, tell me by whom. But we need to think this through because I don't think, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, information is not knowledge and knowledge sure as heck is not wisdom and we need some of the last category. So, thank you. <laughs> I think we're probably supposed to get to questions pretty to soon. Are we supposed to the Q&A here? Uh, we haven't really talked about European allies. Maybe a word or two about our European allies, because I think they're good allies. <laughs> and, uh, they're our best allies. They're our best allies. Well, I like the... Well, I mean, we got Japan and South Korea and, and yeah. Australia and so forth. I mean, we'd like Japan and South Korea to work more together. And again, I think it's more leveraging we can do it, it's more subtle. It's not like saying India is a Pacific country. Um, but I think we need Korea, South Korea and Japan who are just so burdened by their history to try to work through that and, and be a part of uh, you know, Northeast Asia which exports not uh, instability but rather you know, electric cars and stuff. So I, I, I think that it has to be an effort of our policy is to try to get those two countries to do better together. And in Europe, I think we need to understand that it cannot be outsourced to the European Union. It cannot be outsourced to European partners. There is a belt of, uh, of uh, autocracies growing there and we need to take notice and we need to be involved in the solution and not pretend that uh, we have to just you know, have the Europeans take, take it over. I do believe we need to remain, I think NATO is an absolutely crucial uh, um, organization, but that's the military. And I think we need to be very engaged uh, diplomatically as well. And that is why I was so pleased with, the, uh, with President Biden's trip to Europe. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, when people talk, when you compare the United States and, and China, you know, they, uh, they first turn to, uh, obviously, to economic prowess. And there's no question of the uh, great strides that China has made, and, and not only just in their economy, but in technology. Um, uh, uh, but you know, China will inevitably um, pass the United States. This is just inevitable given the size of its country. Uh, but it's important to recall that in the early 19th century, China also had the largest economy in the world. Having the largest economy yeah. does not guarantee survival or continued power or influence in the world. Uh, the second thing I would point out is, uh, and this is where the United States, you refer to our allies and friends around the world, joy, uh, in, enjoys uh, incomparable advantage that China has no expectation of reaching. How many allies does China have in the world? Okay, North Korea, <laughs> Iran, Pakistan, yeah. Then you, uh, then you have to dig kind of deep after that. Russia, well, maybe today, but tomorrow you can't be sure. Uh, how many does the United States have? Probably between 60 and 70 at least. That is, allies with whom we have agreements, understanding, uh, formal alliances, and uh, 
and strengthening those alliances, which is something the uh, previous administration did not do, and in fact uh, seemed to set out to weaken them, uh, is, is basically playing to our comparative advantage. When we can turn to our allies for the support that we need to advance all of our collective interests, it serves us. It's not an exercise in altruism. And moreover, just to carry it more broadly, uh, multilateralism is often criticized. It's a bad word they don't want to use. But in fact, that's how you solve diplomatic problems. When you can't solve them, talking to the other side, you turn to the WTO or to the UN or to some other international or organization to begin to lay some basic groundwork where you can resolve disputes and move forward uh, on, on, on issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that I think, in fact, I'm confident this administration is committed to doing, and they as much as said that at the, at the G7 yeah. and at the NATO summits. Yeah. So. Claire? This first question comes from Richard Dangler, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. He was the USAID Special Advisor for monitoring major infrastructure development in Iraq as well as in Kosovo. So I think his career dovetailed yours in yes, a few locations. Sure yeah. So this circles back to Afghanistan, and he asked, do you believe the Taliban wants peace? And if so, does Afghanistan have a non-corrupt government with whom to negotiate? Yeah. Uh, even at a distance, he's asking the right questions. He always does. Uh, I, I think there are elements of the, uh, of, of the Taliban that do want peace and don't want to go back to their first effort at power, but I think there are a lot of them who are just uh, very full of revenge, and I think it's going to be a very difficult process. So I, uh, I would not feel that we should trust the Taliban in any way, shape, or form. I think, though, the Afghans need to understand that we've done a lot over the years. And by the way, we brought a lot of NATO allies there, too. It wasn't just us. And I think it's time for, you know, they need to show that they care as much as uh, many of us uh, have cared, cared about that. Okay, I'll just remind everybody, if you have a question, raise your hand. Try to keep the mic here. Don't put it here. It doesn't work. Try to keep it up there. Try to keep your questions concise. Pete? Follow up to that. Why are the Pakistanis so supportive of the Taliban? Um, I think the Pakistanis, uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Gary on this, but I really think the Pakistanis continue to think that uh, uh, playing with these radical groups is their way of putting pressure on India and places like Kashmir. And I think they have a very, uh, very narrow view of things. And uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, they just don't believe in us as an ally. They think these groups can uh, be uh, more leveraging for them. Uh, in addition, I think uh, the Pakistanis interpreted our strong presence in Afghanistan, uh, as well as warming relationship with India as a potential threat, and therefore uh, allied themselves with uh, the ones most able to confront that, and that was uh, the Taliban. There are also some tribal affiliations. The, the Taliban is overwhelmingly Pashtun. The Pashtuns are, are the largest uh, ethnic group uh, within Afghanistan. It's about 40-odd percent of the population. The next largest group is down to 27. And so they now feel, Pakistan, that they're sort of back in the catbird seat. Uh, but my own personal view is that's going to be short-lived because of the instability that's now going to be created. Yeah. Uh, and that probably is um, uh, a more positive outcome given some of the reports that we're hearing of what's happening. Yeah. I think, you know, India has outgrown Pakistan. India is engaged everywhere, but Pakistan's not outgrown India. Yeah. And uh, I think they have sadly made use of these uh, radical Islamic groups uh, in the frustration of dealing with Hindu in uh, uh, India. They would they'd be wise to look at the Saudi example and uh, the alliances that, uh, or, and the ideology that they espouse that led to the creation 
of groups that are now reviled around the world, like Al Qaeda and Islamic State. So back to China. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I re have read a few articles recently that talks about how the Chinese average worker's wage has gone up something like 1,400% in the last few decades, and how about 30% of their manufacturing is planning on leaving, like Nike, Samsung are planning on leaving China in the next couple of years. So knowing China always plans way ahead what they're going to do, do you think that has anything to do with their military movements? Also, where do you think they're going to be shifting if they lose a third of their manufacturing that's going to affect their economy? And how will that affect their political stability yeah. of their current government? I, I think they're very worried about precisely what you're talking about. And the, uh, they, it's called in economic terms the middle income trap. And uh, that is why, I mean, but uh, their approach to this is to go really hard on high tech and try to slide out of that middle income trap. I don't think it's so directly related to the, uh, the military buildup. I think that is other dynamics of the kind I, I described. But I think their concern about getting into a stagnant period, you, you notice as well, they you know, long after demographers told them to do this, they finally, you know, gotten rid of the one-child policy because that has been killing them. I mean, they, uh, demographers have an expression that uh, uh, if you're, you know, you better get rich before you get old. And uh, uh, Japan succeeded in doing that. Korea just made it because the population's aging, but they're a wealthy country. China's not there yet. So I think there are a lot of demographic trends that certainly don't support the, the notion that we hear too often in this country that you know, the Chinese are 10 feet, tall, 10 feet high and they're gonna blow us away, et cetera. I mean, I think they have a lot of problems and uh, I, I mentioned their political problems, but I think this, this middle income trap is, very, is a big problem for them and they need to get serious about dealing with it rather than just uh, you know, having more and more autarkic control, um, authoritarian control. And they, um They've just about run out of the export, maximizing the export component of their economy now. I mean, they'll always be a, a major exporter just because of the size of their economy. Uh, but if they're going to continue uh, the successful growth and raising the uh, living standard in China, they're going to have to start looking at Chinese consumers. Manufacturing to meet they, the, the they've they've the inflated domestic Chinese. demand. They they've yeah. done a lot to inflate domestic demand, but because of some of these dynamics. But I I think you're seeing China really trying to do what Japan and Korea did, which is go on the uh, on on the high tech, and uh, but when they do it, unlike the Koreans, uh, you know, in Korea you may have a few Hyundai's coming into this cow into this. Uh, economy, but in China, I mean, it's much bigger. I mean, what they're doing with uh, trying to uh, develop electric cars, uh, trying to develop uh, uh, solar power, I mean, they, they really are trying to stay ahead of it. They're good manufacturers. They're very good, and we need to uh, respect that. Uh, the problem is they haven't played by the, role, by the rules, and moreover, you know, uh, any economist will tell you bilateral deficits don't matter. Well, that's wonderful, except that they do. I mean, people, uh, when you see that, you know, you're being thrown out of work because of all kinds of technological things, and then you look at China running a huge surplus against the U.S., you bet it matters. It's just politically unsustainable. And I think the Chinese need to understand. You know, the Japanese figured that out early on. The Japanese realized, look, we can't be flooding into the U.S. and having this, uh, this uh, trade surplus with them, because sooner or later they're going to come after us, the Japanese. But Japan doesn't have a military to speak of. They're, you know, they managed that, and we managed it with them. With, when China doesn't make this pivot away from high uh, surpluses with us, we get very worried about it because they are aspiring to a bigger role in the world than the Japanese and Koreans are. But to understand Chinese economy, just putting aside the politics of it, look at Korea and Japan in the 1980s, a lot of similarities. Hi, um, back to Afghanistan. Um, in the prior administration, the US led uh, bilateral negotiations with the Taliban 
by passing the Afghan government. What lasting impact do you think that's had on the Taliban's relationship with the Afghan government and the current balance of power? <laughs> you know, I, I would say in this kind of game, uh, you know, I like to think trust isn't a main factor in many aspects of foreign policy. I remember someone asked me, you know, uh, how can the, uh, how can you trust the North Koreans? And I said, well, let me paraphrase Tina Turner, what's trust got to do with it? Because, uh, you know, it's really all about, you know, verification, et cetera. But that, what the, the issue that you uh, raised is absolutely related to trust, and I think it was a big mistake. Uh, it doesn't mean it's easy to bring the, uh, the Afghan, the Kabul government into it, and, and in fact, the Taliban objected to their presence, and this is the kind, you know, North Koreans object to South Korean presence of things, you know, this is what they do. But um, I think it, uh, it's fair to say it was not the right approach because of this, uh, the deleterious effect it had on trust. And, you know, I mean, Napoleon once said, hey, my greatest strength is that I have no allies. And I, I understand what Napoleon meant. I meant, I mean, allies can be a difficult process, having alliances, but I think we, had, we should have done better on that, and I think we're paying some of the price right now. I'd like to turn to uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, I'm only a master's uh, person in international relations and politics. Oh, then not, sit not, down. Not I, I, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the company of masters, I know. <laughs> Barely. Um, but in my lay opinion, although there are many keys to solving the problem of Israel yeah. and Palestine, Hamas yeah. to me is the key, key issue. Hamas? Hamas. Yeah. Yeah. One, do you agree with that? Two, would you comment on, do you ever think that the people in Gaza are ever going to stop suffering the carnage they suffer and turn against uh, Hamas, or is the grip that Hamas has on the population so strong that that's not possible? And number three, what can we do to diminish the power of Hamas yeah. and their ability to uh, be a thorn in this whole yeah. terrible yeah. situation? There is no one key issue in, in that, and uh, believe me, if there were, we probably would have solved it. Um, Hamas is a very problematic issue because it effectively divides the Palestinian people and presents, in many ways, Israel with a ready-made uh, excuse, which happens to be true, they have no one to negotiate with. Because half the Palestinians at the negotiating table would not be represented since Hamas would not be invited. So. Uh, this presents a, a, an obstacle, and right now we've, we, there's no way around it. Um, uh, Israel has avoided going into Gaza yeah. uh, and attempting to eradicate Hamas. It probably has the power to do it, and particularly if they were to get outside help. And by the way, many Arab governments would be standing and cheering them on. Hamas does not have very many friends in the Arab world. The Iranians like them. The Qataris sort of are there for them, and they write the checks, which is in itself a problem as well. Um, so I, I don't see any escape, sadly, for the people of Gaza, because they lack the wherewithal to rise up against the Hamas masters. Uh, they, have, uh, they have lost whatever power and influence they have. They are hostages. They are hostages for use by Hamas against Israel. And Israel and uh, Hamas will look for every opportunity uh, to leverage the military power it's able to build uh, in order to sort of modulate its popularity. It, many, many times Hamas has enjoyed much more popularity in the West Bank, where it's barely represented at all, than it is in Gaza. Because the people in Gaza experience Hamas firsthand. Uh, I don't see any near-term solution um, uh, to the problem of Hamas. Uh, particularly when we know that they're getting uh, support from Hezbollah and from Iran. Uh, Qatar, yeah. we could probably influence, but the Qataris pr provide a considerable amount of humanitarian aid. That but I mean, that if, you're, Gazans need. if you're sitting in the secretary's office and the secretary says, I want to see a strategy uh, for undermining 
Hamas's authority in Gaza. It seems to me some of the elements of it, you would try to uh, interdict some of this support, which includes coming from uh, Iran. Uh, and probably at this point, that's the lion's share because probably the Saudis have restricted, well, they haven't restricted the cuttery, but they're, they're you know, you could probably get Turkey to restrict some cuttery money to Hamas. You could probably work that, that's that end. And then could you have a situation where you find someone else willing to take on the humanitarian chores there, whether it's Saudi money or, you know, our money or somebody's money, and you somehow start uh, uh, trying to take Hamas away from the idea that they keep people fed and clothed. I mean, isn't that the problem? Hamas is essentially allowed to, with thuggish tactics, sort of control all the, uh, you know, the disbursement of, uh, of assistance. Uh, we've tried, I mean, there is no shortage of countries who are willing to support the people of Gaza. Yeah. including the United States yeah. and, the, and the United Nations and Saudi Arabia and other countries. Uh, where the frustration comes is that because Hamas controls what goes into that country, literally everything, everything that goes into that country is controlled by Hamas. This is after it gets through Israel, which is no mean task. But it can, I mean, Israel does approve certain items going into the country. Uh, but we tried so many ways to monitor the goods, including construction materials, to uh, rebuild the schools and homes and hospitals and roads and so forth that get damaged during these conflicts. And then at the end of the day, when we tally it all up, we find out, wait, yeah. there's an imbalance here. There should be so many roads built, schools and hospitals, and there are fewer of all of, all of those. So where did the rest go? Yeah. Tunnels. Uh, and, and purchasing weapons and so forth because they control the black market. Um, they, I mean, I, you, you'd probably be very challenged to find a place in the world where a, a small region and a group of people is so firmly controlled by a single group and it's mm -hmm. through the thuggish tactics. Uh, by the way, there's a bit of thuggery also going on, not nearly the extent it is in Gaza, but in, in the West Bank as well. So with, with Fatah. With, with Fatah yeah. and, uh, and Abu Mazen, the, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, now into his 16th year before your term, uh, having, having canceled the elections that were supposed to take place in uh, first May and then this month and then next month. So um, there's a, there is a lot of frustration and angst on the part of the Palestinians, which is why uh, when the last round of violence broke out, we saw the people in Jerusalem out in the streets marching against the Israelis. And that was all held in check for the most part. Uh, both sides did a lot of things that probably were unwise, but given the emotions involved, understandable, uh, until Hamas saw a golden opportunity to leverage those incidents to elevate its own uh, political profile and uh, put Israel uh, on notice that if they did not stop all the things they were doing in Jerusalem, but they would begin to launch rockets. And uh, even before Israel could make a decision, and we know what Israel was going to do, they started launching rockets, including at Jerusalem, which they'd never done before. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just uh, an example of how influential Hamas can be through the pure exercise of power, yeah. uh, mostly armed power. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on that uh, Israeli Palestinian topic, uh, isn't there a much more fundamental uh, problem that no one seems to be interested in, and that is the, the honest pursuit of a two-state solution? Because that is the only way that both Israel and Palestine will be preserved uh, for their own people. What do you think? Well, you need more than just people who want the peace, uh, and in this case, one that would involve a two-state solution, you need the conditions for it. And the conditions today, certainly among the Palestinians, are simply not there. The Palestinian government, uh, I'm talking about the Palestinian Authority out of Ramallah in the West Bank, uh, has no popular support whatsoever. 
So there is no way that Abu Mazen is going to enter into any type of negotiation, if he could, with the Israelis, because Palestinian people wouldn't accept it, because they, don't, they no longer recognize him as, mm -hmm. as, the, as, the, a, uh, as a legitimate decision maker for the Palestinian people. This is why they took to the streets mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem. So yes, there are many, many people who want a two-state solution, but I have to say that number is declining. In, in, in Israel, and most definitely in the Palestinian territories. It's, uh, it's not that they wouldn't like to have it, they see very little hope of getting it. I mean, it's still in the 30 to 40% category, but there are a lot of people in, among the Palestinians who believe that now it's gonna be a one state solution. It's not one big Palestine. Okay, if it's gonna be Israel in charge of everything, a, one state, a genuine one state solution, then we, the Palestinians, enjoy the same rights as every Jewish Israeli. And that's not something that Israel is going to accept. So they would outnumber them. They would, uh, yeah. they, if not outnumber them, at least it would yeah. be uh, almost a 50-50 balance at this point when you add, add up all the various numbers. Um, and, and, and it's too risky for the Israelis. And, and, and one other uh, if you want an example of why the one-state solution is not going to work, look what happened in this latest round of violence between Israel and Hamas. We saw Arab Israelis taking to the streets uh, and rioting and demonstrating and threatening the lives of other Israelis in multiple cities throughout Israel, something they had never, ever seen before. To me, it was the greatest ex uh, illustration of the unworkability of a one state solution, unless you give equal rights to everyone. And it's not clear that the Israelis would be prepared to do that. So two state is the way, but now we don't have the conditions for it on either side, really. What are Putin's uh, goals and end game for allowing supporting, perhaps funding and directing cyber attacks against various aspects of our economy and infrastructure. What are we and can we, what are we doing about it and what can we do about it? And are we doing any of the similar, similar things to them? Yeah. You mean, well, and that's going to take us to the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the country that is, of course, and we all know it, the country that has got the most capabilities um, is, is Russia. And uh, I think um, Biden has already put Putin on notice. Uh, it seems to be continuing, uh, although, you know, Putin may be saying, I have nothing to do with it. And uh, if it stopped, it would look like he sure had something to do with it. Um, that said, I said the country with the most capabilities is Russia. That's not true. The country with the most capabilities is this country, the United States. And um, I think we're in a strong position to demand some rules of the road. Uh, some of the problems, I think, have to do with, you know, the technology is not there to, you know, have a signature of who, who instituted the attack. I mean, if there, if there were a nuclear detonation somewhere, we'd know exactly where it comes from. We know the signature of, uh, uh, we'd know which, which uh, uh, you know, facility in the world this uh, fissile material came from. Having, that's not successful. We don't have that technology yet in terms of cyber, but I think that will be a big effort to try to be able to identify more clearly where this is coming from. I think uh, coming up with some international rules of the road are, will be essential, but I think ultimately uh, if, we are, if we know where it's coming from, we can certainly uh, make that country regret that it did it. So, um, and sadly, I think that may be the way that this is finally dealt with. Um, you know, uh, there's something, you know, China is a rising power and it does play the long game. You know, it's increasingly problematic in the short game, but it's, it's, it's got some stake in where this world is heading. Russia is a declining power and as such, I think is a far more dangerous power. 
and we're seeing this in this sort of these sort of asymmetric uh, weapons such as cyber attacks. We're also seeing this in a kind of weak state structure where you have all kinds of actors out there spread across uh, Russia. So, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, how do we make this a less corrupt world and all of these things. Well, uh, corruption, you know, I know this from the Peace Corps. I had, when I was in the Peace Corps, I had credit unions that had corruption and credit unions that did, didn't. And what was the difference? Uh, it wasn't that the ones with corruption had bad people and the other ones had good people. It had to do with the quality of the institutions, the quality of the financial management, the quality of the cash uh, system. Treasurers didn't touch cash. Bookkeepers uh, didn't touch cash, you know, things like that. It's about developing institutions. And we live in a world where everyone is knocking every institution. And when you knock institutions, when you drag them down, you're going to get people taking their own uh, things into their own hands. And that's called corruption. And it's called, uh, uh, you know, governments that are simply out of, out of control of their people. So I think a lot of what needs to be done in this world of ours is to have, uh, is to strengthen these institutions, support them, and stop running them down all the time. Because if you don't have good institutions, you're going to have more corruption and you're going to have more wayward states like Russia. Chris, your, your point that you made earlier about the second and third order effects uh, of escalation is very much on the minds of, of this administration yeah. when it comes to um, cyber and cyber attacks. There's no question the United States can exact um, devastating attacks on both the Russian and the Chinese economies if we chose to do so. Uh, I have a good friend who worked in the uh, NSA and was not allowed to get into details, but they pretty much have access to all the systems they need in those countries, yeah. including, in the case of Russia, critical infrastructure, which is oil and the flow of oil. We could shut it down. But I, I think, as you said, Chris, that we're very much concerned that if we respond in kind to a cyber attack in that fashion, then Russia does something yeah. else. Who's going to control that? And, and then uh, yeah. who starts controlling it? And then yeah. when does China start getting really nervous and say, when, does the, when, when do the Americans turn to us? Look what they've done to the Russians. And by the way, we're very dependent on that oil. So yeah. I, I think this is where, why the administration successfully was able to persuade Putin. Let's see if he actually takes action now. Doesn't seem so, in, uh, at least in the initial stages, uh, that we start talking about uh, some basic negotiations of putting um, certain sectors off limits when it comes to cyber. There's always gonna be, that's always out there. Now, this is gonna be a fact of life going forward, just yeah. as espionage was. Uh, but uh, we, we ought to be able to put some sectors aside. And if, if I could just make one point, it's not a major point, but when these things happen, uh, you often have people saying, well, you should declassify the information that you've, you, that you've got. And if you declassify the information, everyone will say, aha, they, they really did it. Thank you for declassifying. It doesn't work that way. First of all, they deny it anyway. And secondly, when you declassify something that you have spent years, capabilities that you've spent years to develop, whether it's Humint or, or SIGINT or something, you just declassify it because you want to look good on the evening news, you will put yourself way behind. You, you will be in far worse trouble. So when people say, well, they should just declassify the information that says that the Russians did this, be very weary of that kind of wary of that kind of thing because it is often just nonsense and it doesn't lead to any uh, any solution. So I think we've covered the whole world. Uh, so, you know, uh, well, you know, left our good I mean, Canada, Mexico. Yeah. But hey, if. If you, have, if you have kids or grandkids who are thinking, gee, should I join the Foreign Service? The answer is yes. And it's, it's not just that our country is back, but I think our, our diplomacy, this concept that we live here in the world with everyone else, and we, you know, we're not going to be uh, successful with diplomacy unless we have some diplomats. So, if, you know, you meet some kid out there who says he's thinking about it, you twist his arm till he takes the Foreign Service exam and passes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right.